telling them. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. Hello, everyone. I really appreciate that you uh, stuck around until the end of the day. I know that conferences can sometimes be long. So I'm going to get into how we run our systems that are increasingly complex with microservices, multi-cloud environments. How do we actually tame that complexity? And how do we actually make sure that it allows our teams to still function? And for ourselves as workers or as managers of teams, how do we make sure that we can continue to run these services sustainably, not just in terms of the computer resources, but also in terms of our own resources? So fundamentally, I hope that I don't have to argue to people in this audience that our job when we write code is not done when we commit the code. That we are writing code to solve problems, but that code is not the be all end all of what we are trying to accomplish. Instead, we have to think about what happens after we hit commit. What happens when code enters the continuous integration and deploy process? What happens when our code actually reaches production and is subject to the myriad of things that our users can wind up doing to our code? And that, I think, is where we really need the art of production excellence to come in. Because our production environments are so, so complex, and some of that is accidental complexity, and some of that is deliberate complexity that we've introduced in order to add more features, in order to make our services be able to better support the many needs of our users. So especially when you add elements of cloud native or hybrid environments or multi-cloud environments, that's adding complexity to your system. And we need to make sure that we're getting appropriate return on investment for what we're putting in in terms of the complexity. And we're adding complexity all the time, right? Every time someone adds a new microservice, that's something that we have to manage. Anytime someone decides that it's their pet project, that they would like to add some Kubernetes, or they would like to add, uh, you know, they would, like to, they would like to add a use of the latest machine learning service, right? That's adding complexity. So we have to think about taming that. And I think that as we think about that, we can't rely on the previous definitions of uptime that used to work for us. Because it used to be that when you said my service was up, it meant my server, you could ping it, that my server was physically up. And if my server was down, then it was 100% down, right? Cleanly up or down. But I don't think our services operate that way anymore. You, you certainly wouldn't be at this conference if you were running just one server, right? How many people here run more than uh, 10 services, let's say? Run more than 10 services? Yeah, right? Like, that's a lot of people. And that's a lot of servers that we have to run. So our services are no longer binary up or down. And we can't even say, you know what? AWS is working perfectly, so my service is working perfectly. Or GCP is working perfectly, my service is working perfectly. That's no longer the case, right? Like, your clouds are always constantly in a state of at least some portion being degraded. So that doesn't work either. And we can't wait for users to complain. We cannot wait for users to come to us and say, my service is completely broken. I'm, I'm asking for a refund. That doesn't work either. We have to be a little bit more, more proactive than that, although complaints can be a lagging indicator of pain. And then we have all the other challenges, right? Like we have to support feature delivery alongside reliability demands. And that means that it can get a little bit hairy. So we need to pick different strategies than the ones that used to work 15 years ago or even the ones that used to work five years ago. Because five years ago, people were not seriously using multiple clouds, and now they are. So we need to take, to take a different approach. And I know that you've heard from a lot of people who are vendors today. I don't intend to, uh, to step onto that, onto that uh, demo bling train. Um, what I'm going to instead, instead ask you to do is, please do not buy DevOps. Like, please do not. And I say this as some, kindly and gently as someone who works at a vendor. Do not buy DevOps. You, you're not going to be able to buy your way out of the solution. Because I think part of what happens when you try to is when you're favoring tools over actually changing your culture, and that doesn't stick. That doesn't actually work. When you order the alphabet soup, you instead wind up with chaos, and not good chaos of the form that Anna Medina was telling us about, but bad chaos, right? If you uh, implement continuous, in, uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery, and then you... Uh, <laughs> You push code as quickly as you can because the build was green, right? 
except you're not actually testing for the quality of your code. You're actually testing, you know, did it compile, did it pass the unit test, and not does the whole system work as a whole? So you're actually breaking the system super, super fast, and that's not sustainable. Also, let's talk about Terraform. Let's talk about infrastructure as code for a moment. What happens when you go from being able to accidentally bring down one server if you accidentally shut down dash H it, to being able to accidentally turn down your entire AWS environment with one bad Terraform apply? It's not sounding so great now, is it? Right, like we need more safeguards. We can't just blindly apply tools. Or what about just, you know, I hear Kubernetes is cool, let's get a Kubernetes, and I hear multi-cloud is cool, let's get a multi-cloud. I have no business use for one, but let's get one anyways, right? Like, we cannot pursue our pet projects just because they seem fun and cool. And finally, let's talk about PagerDuty. I do really love PagerDuty, but please do not just think your problem is solved with, I have given my developers production ownership by putting them in the PagerDuty rotation. That, that's, that's not working, right? What happens when you put someone directly into the on-call rotation with no preparation is they cannot sleep at night. They cannot be creative, they cannot come to work and bring their best self to work. And they get grumpy and they shut off their pagers. But let's suppose you do find a hard-working developer who's going to burn out in three months, but let's suppose you do find a dev who goes and answers the page at 2 a.m. And they open, I, I think that Sysdig is a great product, but like they open the Sysdig dashboard, right? And they, and they see this wall of like 20 different dashboards with 20 different graphs on each page. Where do I start looking? And that's not even looking at the custom generated dashboards, that's just looking at the automatically generated, I see you have a MySQL, here's a MySQL dashboard dashboards. And then you go like digging through, through the last five incidents worth of dashboards because someone said, postmortem action item, let's add a new dashboard. That's going to solve my problem, right? And it turns out that we spend the first 20 minutes out of every single outage looking at dashboards, trying to figure out which line wiggled at the same time as that other line. And while we're digging through all of those dashboards, our users are waiting, and our users are becoming increasingly frustrated with us and heading for the exits. Finally, 30 minutes into that incident, you give up, you call your boss, you call your tech lead. It's not their turn on call, but they're grumpy and they're groggy and they say, okay, like I'll, I'll help you and then I'll get right back to sleep. And this repeats every single night, every single person that's on call. The tech lead gets woken up every single night. Not sustainable, right? And then in the theme of like pushing as fast as you can, right? Like during the daytime, people are deploying code and the build is green and it keeps on getting pushed out and it keeps on getting rolled back and pushed out and rolled back and pushed out and rolled back. Because we're not testing for do the connections between the things work, we're testing for our, does each individual box work? Does it, each individual container work? Guess what? If your containers working was a guarantee that your service was working, none of us would have jobs today. So, you're tired. You're really, really grudging and you don't want to be doing this anymore. But your boss says you have to do projects, you have to do feature work, you have to answer the pager. And that little reliability work thing, like, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Like, you know, we have to keep the service up. This, keeping the service up is the most important thing, right? But you find two hours and you're like, okay, what should I do in order to re improve reliability? And you realize that you have no plan. There's no list of items that someone has prepared or that you have prepared to help you think through how do I calm the noise and stop this problem from happening again. So our teams often find that they're struggling to hold on when we introduce too much complexity at once or when we take a tool first approach and add complexity rather than reducing the complexity. How many of you feel like this is the state of your team? Sometimes, all the time, how many of you have seen this on a past team? Let me rephrase this so it doesn't make you look bad if, someone, if there's a tape. Okay, yeah, that's better, right? Okay, so, so you're familiar with this situation, even if you won't admit it about your current job. Great. Okay, so what are we missing? How do we dig ourselves out of this situation? I think what we're missing is that we have failed to account for the fact that our systems are not just technical systems. Instead, they're socio-technical systems. The humans who operate the system are a part of the system, and we have to treat those humans as the most important resource, not even your users. Because it turns out that if you burn out every single human who works at your job, 
you will turn out to not be able to support users at all, right? So you have to take care of your own people first. Put on your own oxygen mask first before you worry about other people, right? So our tools are not magical. Tools cannot magically solve a culture problem. Your tools can nudge you, can remind you, can help further the direction that your leadership or you have set, but they cannot completely reverse course no tool is going to suddenly reverse a culture of people blaming and shouting at each other. No tool is going to magically reverse a flood of pages. AI ops is not going to save your ass. Sorry, I should avoid swearing. Um, AI ops is not going to save your bacon better. So instead, we have to focus on deciding what culture changes we want to accomplish and then finding the tools that will help us further that. And we have to invest in our people, our culture, and our process in order to do that. So this is what I call the art of production excellence as opposed to production ownership. Production ownership mostly means in this day and age someone hands you a pager. Production excellence means that you're actually empowered and trained and feel like you can handle the challenges of running a production service. We have to make our services not just more reliable but more friendly for operators. And we have to plan. We have to work through what are we going to do to accomplish that and what are the milestones along the way? How can I tell whether I'm making a difference? How can I tell what I want to work on next based off of what I'm seeing in my socio-technical system today? You cannot do this in isolation. We have to do this not just as engineering teams but as entire business units. You cannot do this without the buy-in of your customer success team, your sales team, your cloud provider, or your uh, on-premises IT operations team, right? Like, we all have to work together in order to make this work. And we have to be able to clearly communicate. We can't just say, that's not my problem. We can't say, I can't believe you didn't know that, Liz. Right, like, that does not work. We have to encourage people to ask questions and clearly communicate in order to collaborate on better, building a better future. So how do we get started? I think there are four things that we need to do in order to succeed at adding production excellence to our teams. The first one is that we have to know when our services are too broken. I'll come back to why too broken and not just broken in a moment. Secondly, we have to be able to debug our systems when they are too broken in collaboration with other teams and business units. And then we have to close that feedback loop. We have to be able to mitigate and eliminate unnecessary complexity. There's always going to be essential complexity, like if you're trying to run a highly available service that can survive multiple cloud providers going down, yes, of course you need multi-cloud, of course you need all of that management complexity, but you have to also deal with your technical debt along the way because if you fail to pay down the debt, it's just going to compound and overwhelm your people. So let's go back to what too broken means. I would argue that our systems are always failing all the time. There is no such thing as a system that is 100% up, unless you have infinite money, of course. So as a result, we need to not think about trying to make every single blade of grass in our lawns green. Instead, we need to look at, is the overall lawn look green enough? And that's how we should think about our services overall. So we need to measure, what does too broken mean? And how can we actually do that? Well, we need to borrow something from site reliability engineering called the service level indicator. The service level indicator and its cousin, the service level objective, provides common language for us as engineers to talk with our business owners and to our customers and allows us to communicate expectations about the reliability of the service and what it means for the service to be up and available enough to satisfy our customers. So, I too think that we do need context, but I think the context that we need is not around individual containers and machines. The context we need is around events, around user journeys. Who are our users? What are they trying to accomplish? What are the common properties that we see? Like user IDs, client IDs, geographic locations, bill IDs, which services a request passed through. These are all important properties that can allow us to group together customer experiences and understand what properties good and bad customer experiences share. And we can't just sit there looking at individual events and saying good, good, bad, bad, right? Like we have to teach machines to do it for us. 
So that means that we need to understand what the user requirements are and express them in the form of code. And sometimes that means asking your product manager, right? Sometimes it means doing chaos engineering experiments in order to understand, you know, do users turn away at 200 milliseconds or 250 milliseconds, right? So we have to be able to understand what distinguishes good and bad quality of service and come up with a threshold. Yesterday we saw at the keynote that 100 milliseconds is the key threshold for whether an experience feels like it's interactive in real time or not. Of course, you may not need interactive in real time, but for some situations you do. So figuring out which ones you do need that latency for and which ones humans do expect to wait. Like you expect to wait a few seconds for your credit card to process, but you do not expect browsing a storefront to take a few seconds. So for instance, I might decide that a user journey is good if a fetch to the home page is served with HP 200 and latency less than 100 milliseconds. And Alex Hidalgo talked about this a little bit in his talk, so I highly encourage you to look at it afterwards. And we have to go and furthermore decide which events are eligible, because that botnet that's slamming us and we're serving them 403s, that shouldn't count for or against us, right? That's not a real user. What we care about is real user experiences. Similarly, our internal health check, that should not be counted, right? So once we've calculated the denominators, the eligible events, and the number of good events, that gives us an availability percentage that we have achieved. And then we can decide what our target is. What are we aiming for? Are we aiming for three nines, four nines, five nines? And sometimes a good guideline for thinking about this is, is it okay if my service is 100% down for five minutes? Would that be okay to happen once a month? Right, that gives you an indication of, okay, if it's five minutes, that's about, you know, 99.99%. So similarly, we need to think about the length of time over which we're measuring, right? If I call up my boss and say, hey, guess what? Yesterday we were 100% down, but today we are 100% up. Are you happy with my performance? They'd probably say, uh, wait a second, our users are going to remember that yesterday you had 100% outage. So we need to think about having a window of time that we measure over. So for instance, I might say I expect 99.9% .9 of user journey events to be good over the past 30 days, where an event is defined as good if it's HD 200 and if it is served in less than 100 milliseconds. So how do I know whether my service level objective is good or not? I'd argue your service level objective is good if it barely keeps your users happy. If that's the case, you're not trading off feature velocity for reliability, right? You're not saying, I'm going to try to achieve as many nines as I can and not deliver any features, right? You're delivering just the right amount of reliability. Sure, if I go and try to fetch my boarding pass for American Airlines on my phone, sometimes it'll fail. And sometimes it'll be the network, sometimes it'll be American Airlines, and that's okay, right? I expect it to fail some of the time, that's okay. So what can we do with this concept? Well. We can drive our alerting with service level objectives. We can no longer wake ourselves up in the middle of the night over things that don't matter, that are not actually interfering with the customer experience. So in order to do this, we need the concept of the error budget, of the amount of allowed and availability. If I'm targeting having no more than one in a thousand events fail, and I receive 100 million events per month, that means I am allowed to have 100,000 failures per month. And if I'm draining 1,000 of them per minute, that means I'm going to run out of my error budget in 100 minutes. That means I should probably be woken up. However, if it's going to take me days to run out of my error budget, maybe it can wait for the next business day. I don't have to wake up. And if it's something that doesn't affect my users at all, like an individual disk went from 89.99% to 90.001% full, I don't actually have to care about that. So no, I'm not adding more noise. I'm adding a little bit more high, uh, I'm adding a little bit more high fidelity alerting in order to get rid of noisy alerts. The second thing that we can do with service level objectives is to make our business decisions based off of data. You no longer have to say, my gut feeling is that we're moving too fast or moving too slow. You have objective data to say, we have promised to deliver this level of reliability, and if we're delivering better than that, we can afford to move faster. That A-B test product wants to run, go ahead. That feature flag that someone wants to turn on to experiment with Kubernetes, go ahead, as long as you know how to revert it. 
And can we safely, safely migrate between cloud providers? Well, if you have a service level objective, you know what your yardstick is for measuring. Is my GCP environment doing the same as my on-prem environment? Conversely, if I'm having a lot of outages, I can say, sorry, mixed product manager, I cannot deliver that feature right now. Instead, we need to focus on reliability because otherwise, no user is going to see that feature because they've given up on the reliability of our service. So having a perfect SLO is not necessary for this because whatever you are not measuring, you cannot take action on. So focus on measuring a good enough service level objective and then iterate from there. A lot of us have load balancer logs. Load balancer logs are great. They have key information like latency, response code, and sometimes even information on which user it's coming from. Use those logs to at least establish a baseline of your performance. And then you can get more sophisticated and do real user monitoring. And then iterate to meet your user needs. If you have outages that are getting not caught by your service level objective, then you need to make your SLO better. If you are having your SLO fire and no one's actually calling customer support, maybe you can relax your SLO. So this way we can only alert on what matters and reduce the noise. So that solves kind of the first half of the problem of having too noisy of a pager and too much operational overload. But what it does not solve yet is our ability to debug. So let's talk about our ability to debug. Our outages are never identical because if you were having the same outage day in, day out, like Groundhog Day, you'd probably be a bad engineer, right? You would probably not actually be dealing with the engineering constraints of your problems, right? If you just let the same outage happen over and over. So as a result, we live as engineers in the realm of the unknown unknown. We don't know what's going to break and we can't predict how we're going to have our services break. So instead, we have to have comfort with debugging novel cases that we've never seen before in production because it's not a good enough excuse to say, you know what, that customer's suffering, they've been suffering for two weeks and we've been trying to reproduce it in staging for two weeks. It doesn't cut it anymore, right? So we have to be able to look into production and understand real user behavior. And we have to form and test hypotheses when I pick up the pager, the first thing I do is I try to formulate what do I think has happened and what do I think needs to happen to make things go back to working well enough? How can I mitigate this outage, right? So if it takes me too long to understand what's going on in my system, that's increasing the length of time that users are suffering. So we have to be able to ask new questions of our data and of our telemetry in order to understand what's going on in our services. All of this is to say that our services need to be observable. Observability formally is defined as the property of a system such that you can understand the internal state of the system based off of the externally observable outputs of the system. However, I think a more workable definition is, can we answer the business questions about our system that we need to without pushing new code? So can we examine these events in context? And can we understand what separates the events that are succeeding our service level indicator from those who are failing it? Can we actually, in the words of Ben Siegelman from Lightstep, can we understand and explain the variance between those events so that we can harmonize them and get them back to normal again? And even better yet, do we have to do this at 2 a.m.? Or can we automatically roll back the bad release? Can we automatically roll back the cloud migration? Can we automatically drain a data center? and have enough telemetry available so we can understand what happened during business hours. Observability goes beyond break fix. I've talked a lot about break fix in this, but I think it's important to pay attention to the other facets. We need to be able to use the same tools that we use to test in production to also test in our development environments. We shouldn't use disparate tools to understand dev and prod. We should be able to understand if I commit code today, will it reach production an hour from now, two hours from now, a day from now? Can I understand what my users are actually doing inside of my system? And can I make the argument of here's where our technical debt is and here's what we need to do to fix it? These are observability questions just as much as is this microservice the reason why the service is failing? Those are all observability questions. And it's not just the data. No matter how much vendors will try to sell you on logs, metrics, traces, Observability is instead a capability revolving around, do you have a good enough and easy enough to use instrumentation framework? 
can you store the data in a cost economical fashion? And can you issue runtime queries of arbitrary kinds in order to answer your questions? That's observability, it's not just the data. So SLOs tell you when things are too broken, and observability tells you how you can fix your systems and how you can prevent it from happening again. But you cannot run a system with production excellence without also having collaboration. We cannot operate with heroism in our business. We all deserve the right to go on vacation. We all deserve the right to turn off, we need to have the right to turn off our pagers and our phones once in a while. And that means that we need to get all of the knowledge about our services that's locked in our heads and share it with other people and make sure that they can get on the same page as us. John Allspaw's research talks a lot about the idea of shared state, of trying to understand what factors are hidden in someone's model about our system. So how do we get more of that made explicit? How do we make sure that this shared model of debugging is not just shared between software developers on your team, but instead with your upstream dependencies in, with your customer service? How do you make sure that's shared across roles? And how do you make sure that you're actually exercising this? Anna talked earlier today about like, how do you actually do uh, disaster training? How do you actually exercise and make sure that you're doing chaos game days to make sure that you know how your teams work together? Can we actually collaborate and talk to each other? Do we feel safe taking risks and saying like, hi, I'm not sure how that works. Or hi, I think my change might have broken the build, right? If you know that you're going to get yelled at, then you're not going to raise your hand and that's going to cause your outages to last longer. We also have to treat on-call as a team sport. No individual should be holding up on-call for a week straight, even if you're a small startup. We need to be able to accommodate people who can't work on-call because of Shabbat. We have to be able to accommodate managers who can't take on-call while they're having sensitive one-on-ones. And we have to make sure that we're writing down the right amount of information so that people can mitigate problems, even if it takes them longer to thoroughly debug. And that means that we have to have good documentation that's easy to find. We have to make sure that we have good documentation that people can quickly understand when was it last updated, what's stale, what might be misleading. And we need to make sure that we're using common tooling and common language so that we don't have the situation of people saying, oh, it's green on my dashboard, the network monitors look fine, right? We have to use the same tooling in order to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And we have to thank each other and be grateful for the work that we do together. Make sure that you thank that person who helped you with an incident at 4 p.m. on Thursday. Make sure that you're shouting out that customer who was really patient and helped you uncover a new, fe a new feature that you needed to build. And we have to make sure that we're closing that feedback loop and we're learning from our, future, uh, from our past selves for the future. Because you're not just collaborating with your current team, you're collaborating with everyone in the future, including yourself, who might interact with your coder system. Our outages don't exactly repeat, but they definitely rhyme. They're commonalities, and I think we need to talk about how we address these. So we need to conduct risk analysis. We need to plan. We need to figure out what's the most important thing we can work on reliability-wise, and is it worth doing right now? If I have a bridge, and there's a hole in the road deck and cars are falling through it, and it needs a seismic retrofit in the next 20 years, and it needs a fresh coat of paint, which one of these should I address first? should probably address the thing that's causing people to fall into the ocean, right? So that means that we have to think about things like how often does this happen and how severe is it when it does? Often we have control over how often something happens but not necessarily, sorry, often we do not have control over how often something happens. What we do have control over is how badly it impacts people. Do I need to push releases to 100% of users every single time? Or can I canary things to 1% of users first? That reduces the blast radius, and that can be really powerful. Can I reduce how long it takes to discover problems? Or can I reduce how long it takes to debug them? That, again, reduces the amount of time that people are impacted. You know, yes, you don't know when that database outage is going to happen. It could happen a month or a year from now, right? But you can at least have a rough order of magnitude understanding. And that allows us to identify which risks are the most significant and how can we mitigate them. And one thing that I learned recently is that the entire domain of systems analysis exists. 
and it runs systems that are far more safety critical than any of ours. Airplanes, nuclear power plants, right? These are all understood with systems theoretic process analysis as well as fault tree analysis. And these are tools that can help us surface risks in our system and help us understand what's most important to work on. So my argument to you is you only need to address the risks that threaten your service level objective because that's what you've promised to deliver. And having this map enables you to make the business case to fix them. If you agree that one in a thousand requests at most will fail, and something is causing one in 2,500 requests to fail, that's a serious risk to you achieving the overall goal of one in a thousand requests failing. And that lets you go back and say, you know what? We need to pause work on that feature because we have a bigger problem to deal with. And you need to prioritize actually completing work in order of most severe to least severe. Do not add useless items to your postmortems. Like, yes, that nice to have is nice, but you're never gonna get to it. Like, don't add it to your list of, of stuff to worry about. And don't work on risks as a first in, first out queue, right? Focus on completing as much stuff to mitigate risk as makes sense for your budget. And do not waste time Chrome polishing. Like, yes, it is important to explore multi-cloud. It is important to explore chaos engineering. But if you are suffering from issues of the fundamentals of stability, it's important to get those under control first before you worry about things that affect the longer tail of potential incidents. A few last words on systematic risk. If you have a lack of observability, that is a systemic risk. If every outage you have takes an extra 20 or 30 minutes to debug, you will never be able to achieve a 49's service level objective because you have to be able to solve outages within five minutes in order to achieve a 99.99% service level objective, right? That means you need automatic mitigation. You need the ability to detect the system in a degraded state and respond to it in a prompt manner. So you have to have good observability to run a sufficiently reliable system, and that means that you need to invest in having high quality telemetry and analysis capabilities. The second high risk area that I see that people don't focus on enough is lack of collaboration. If every outage that you have takes longer to detect because customer service got yelled at the last time they tried to report an issue, that's a problem. If your customer service team cannot say, hey, um, I think that everyone using Safari on Mac is broken, that's a problem, right? You can go weeks without that actually getting escalated. So we have to deal with that more proactively. And that means building a culture with psychological safety. You don't have to be a hero to have success in operating reliable software and operating reliable software across multiple clouds. What you instead need is a thoughtful approach to your culture. So yes, tools can be useful by the right tools. And yes, sometimes that might include honeycomb with the caveat that it may or may not be appropriate for you. But season your soup of tools with production excellence. Make sure that you're adopting the right practices for your culture in order to succeed. So because everyone else has shown a little bit of their product, there is a little bit of my product there. Um, you're welcome to talk to me for a demo, but I'm not going to waste your time with it on stage right now. Um, many of the things I do talk about are implemented in Honeycomb, but you don't have to pick Honeycomb. Lightstep is great. Um, many other tools are great for this. So production excellence brings our teams closer together by enabling to measure when things are too broken, debug problems in real time, collaborate on the solutions, and close the feedback loop and fix the problems for the long term so that we can run a service with increasing complexity with the same number of humans not burning out and delivering all the features that our users need. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Did you want to take questions, Liz? Or? Yes, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I will repeat them so they can be captioned. Um, so I have got five minutes for questions. Yes, over there. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, uh, you mentioned several times observability is a very important feature. Uh, but uh, I, I, as a developer, usually find that uh, these requirements uh, arrive in late in the development stage of the project when it's time to hand it over to SREs. And then you usually what you do is you bolt on uh, ad hoc observability system 
that becomes fragile, it's, it gets frequently out of sync with uh, you when you deploy new features, and it's basically a nightmare, or it's a burden for the development team. And so um, this is all great in theory, but can you give us some practical advice where we are under pressure of limited time, li limited resources, how to operate in this environment where you're constantly under pressure of uh, delivering new features versus making the system more uh, reliable? Sure. Uh, to summarize the question, the question was how do we shift observability left? How do we make sure that observability is not an afterthought? So to answer that, I think that we have to go back to the problem of instrumentation. If you remember earlier, I talked about the fact that instrumentation is a key aspect of observability and that if you do not have good instrumentation that developers can actually use, then you're never going to be able to achieve good observability, right? So I think that that's where frameworks like OpenTelemetry, which is a collaboration between all of the major observability providers such as Lightstep and Honeycomb, as well as many others, right? What we are doing with OpenTelemetry is making sure that people only have to instrument once, that it's clear to understand, that it's easy to do, and so that you don't wind up locked into any vendor. And I think that eliminates a lot of the pressures and we're being thoughtful about the API design, right? I think that we have succeeded when it is as easy for a developer to write a key value pair to a trace span that they're already in because it's automatic, automatically created, and that it's easier for them to do that than it is to add a log line, right? I think that unstructured log lines are the thing that developers resort to because they have no better options, right? And I think that when we add to our framework the capability to have trace spans automatically created so you can just put a key value pair that you find useful into your environment, and then it automatically gets to pick up your instrumentation. I think that that's kind of the right way to go, to make sure that you're shifting left, that you're building in from the beginning, and that you're not trying to retrofit it in after the fact. Yes, I recognize this is challenging on an existing project. What I suggest is make sure that for your next project, right, or if you have an infrastructure team, make sure that your infrastructure team, in the same way that they're saying, this is how our builds work, make sure that they also have a solution for this is how our observability works, right? Here is how you output to open telemetry inside of every process, and here are collectors that siphon it up and send it to the provider of choice. Over there in the back. Uh, thanks, Blanche. Um, it was interesting when I was on the panel discussion earlier this morning, it turns out like half the audience was from financial services. And oftentimes now I'm having a lot of conversations with people that are in financial services where the typical SRE best practices and typical production excellence practices that you would have, like you have an error budget and canary deployments and things like that, they're like, yeah, I can't have any downtime at all because I get massive fines and things like that. I was wondering if you just had any um, quick tidbits of advice or future links or something like that that you would give to those types of systems where you can't really apply the same level of principles to them. Sure, the question was in financial services or other uh, types of environments where you have a higher level of reliability than say four nines, right? Where you have to operate a five or six nine service, how do you manage that? And I think the answer is that you almost operate it like a three or four nine service that is maintaining the reliability of a five nine service. Let's take an example. Um, Durability, right? I think everyone can relate to the idea of durability, that you should not have AWS lose your data, you should not have GCP lose your data, you should not lose your data, right? And the way that we think about this, rather than trying to say, you know what, if I have a single data loss event, I've blown my error budget for, for 11 quintillion years, right? Like, that's not a good approach to it. Instead, the better approach to it is to say, I am only going to allow, you know, uh, one in 10,000 files to be at an elevated risk state, right? I think that's kind of the better approach to error budgets in a super high availability environment, is thinking about risk states. How often are you willing to tolerate something being in a slightly higher risk state, rather than trying to alert on how often do you have a, 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 out, a outage that impinges upon your five or six nines SLO? So I think that's kind of the right approach. So am I successfully making sure that at all times, or at 99.99% you know, .99 of the time, that every file is replicated at least n equals three, right? And then if it goes to n equals two, right, then that counts against that SLO without being an actual data loss event. So kind of when you set SLOs around kind of the success criteria for maintaining the broader business goal, I think that that's the right approach to take for those environments. So SLOs on redundancy. 
Okay, excellent. I am out of time, but I am available. Uh, I think there might be a slight break. Otherwise, like, I'll be outside and around. So thank you so much. And thank you to my captionist for doing this on such short notice.